Good morning, everyone. Lovely to see you. My name is Sarah Travers. I'm delighted to have been asked to uh, be MC for today's AFB conference, the first face-to-face -face conference in a long time. It's so fabulous to see everyone in the room. Now, uh, we have a super uh, day-long event packed full of great speakers for you today, but I need you to all take out your mobile phones now because we're going to be using Slido. Are you familiar with Slido? Hands up. And hands up who's never heard what I'm talking about before. Okay, oh, only a few, that's great. So there are two ways to do this. You can either, um, well, we need to get you onto the Wi-Fi first of all. So, phones out, devices out, even your PC you can also use. So, we need to get onto the Hilton Honours Wi-Fi. We're going to do this together and then everybody's singing from the same hymn sheet. <laughs> so, Hilton Honours, and once you get through there, you don't need to put your name or a room number in or anything like that. You click on Promotional Code. Now, if you're on your PC, uh, it's this, it, you can actually log into then slido.com. But if you're on your devices, your phones, um, you, there's a QR code that we're going to use, which is on the table in front of you. Are we all together? <laughs> so have we managed to get... So you use your camera on your phone or your device to scan the QR code. It will offer you something up on the screen, which you then click through, which takes you to Slido. Don't know actually if you photograph it up there, will it work? Does it work up there, maybe? I think you have to be quite close. Or the one, the Wi-Fi code, I beg your pardon, sorry, Caroline, is Kingfisher, all lowercase. I knew there was one thing I was supposed to tell you there. Kingfisher. <coughs> This is fun, isn't it? This is getting everybody engaged and connected at the start. So hopefully we're all on the Wi-Fi now. We've managed to get through. We've scanned the QR code. So Kingfisher lowercase is the password. Is anybody having any difficulties at all? Hands up. Good, right, we're, are we all there? So have we, have we come through to Slido? So we're going to test it. We're going to use Slido today for all of the panel sessions. So we'd love to have as much interaction today as possible. There will be the old fashioned way of putting your hand up and we'll get a microphone to you and you can ask your question. But you'll be able to see, um, you know, as we go through the day, the various panel sessions, the speakers that are coming up. And we'd love you to submit your questions either in advance of those panels or as they are uh, taking place. The chairs will be able to see all the questions that you send through on their device. But as I say, if you really want to put your hand up the old fashioned way, we can do that too. <coughs> well, we have a little practice. Okay, here we go. Here's a really tough question. So sometimes we use Slido for polls as well. Let's just see if everybody's on there and that it's working. Here's a really tough question. Did you have tea or coffee this morning when you arrived at the Hilton in Temple Patrick? There's no other, unfortunately. 73% have gone straight for the hard stuff so far. That is good. Great, it seems to be working. 29% um, have had tea. I know I spoke to Paul earlier and he's had his wherever he is. He's had his caffeine fix for the day. Uh, but we have 70% have had coffee. So everybody seems to have got to grips with Slido. You'll also see on Slido an option for submitting questions as well. So please do submit your questions. If you could say who you are, where you're from when you're submitting the questions. That's great information for our uh, chairs for each of the panel sessions also. Thank you so much for your patience, folks, but I think it's great to get that done out of the way before we start. Um, obviously, uh, we're not expecting any fire alarm or fire drill today, but if you just be aware of the exits, we're, we're served very well with emergency exits in here. Should a fire alarm go off, we will then wait for instruction from the team at the Hilton Temple Patrick. 
Now, let's get down to business. The theme of our conference today, of course, all eyes on COP27 at the minute in Egypt, but our theme is carbon and beyond. And the programme today will be presented by a number of AFB's leading scientists alongside internationally renowned specialists looking at the areas of leading, protecting and enhancing. So when we say leading, we're talking about leading innovations to enhance sustainability and circularity within the Northern Ireland agri-food industry. When we talk about protecting, this is the role of animal health in achieving our environmental goals. And then enhancing, that's all about optimising ecosystem services from our land and our seas. We have packed an awful lot in today. The first session that will run shortly will run right up until lunchtime, but it's an early lunch break for you at 12 o'clock. I'll give you more information when we reach that time. But first of all, it uh, gives me great pleasure to introduce the AFB CEO, you'll know him very well, Dr. Stanley McDowell. Good morning, everyone. Um, really like to welcome you here to today's conference, uh, AFB Outlook Conference 2022, Carbon Beyond. I think after all of the challenges of COVID, 19 over the last two and a half years. It's great to be back in an in in-person conference and great to see such a turnout today of stakeholders, other scientists and colleagues. I'm particularly pleased to welcome the DRA Permanent Secretary, uh, Katrina Godfrey. Katrina, we very much appreciate you taking the time out to be here with us today and agreeing to provide the opening address. A warm welcome also to our guest speakers, um, to Professor Sinead Waters from Chagas, Dr. Philip Skus from Morden, uh, Professor Ilias Karazakis from Queen's University Belfast, and Dr. Lisa Norton from the UK Centre of Ecology and Hydrology. Welcome also to all of the various panel members who have agreed to join us today uh, for the various panel discussions. We really do appreciate everyone taking the time to present or to be part of the panels and the perspectives that you will bring to the various sessions and discussions. The topic of today's conference, Carbon and Beyond, could not be more topical. The issue of climate change is widely regarded as the single largest challenge that the world faces. A challenge which, if we're to avoid the worst effects, will require profound change on how we all work and live and as a need for society to, to transition to a zero, lower zero carbon economy. Climate change and society's response to it will also mean significant changes ahead for the agri-food industry as it seeks to play its part through reducing emissions, increasing the sequestration or capture of carbon, and ultimately adapting to the predicted impacts of increased temperatures and other climate changes. But with challenges also comes opportunity. Opportunities for new sources of growth and employment and new approaches to problems. Importantly, it's the role of science to help provide information and evidence and to provide solutions. Information and evidence to inform policies and decision making and solutions which in this case aims to allow the twin aims of economic growth and environmental and planetary sustainability. As Sarah has referred to, our scientific work in AFBE is centred across three themes of leading improvements in the agri-food industry, protecting animal plant and human health, and enhancing the, natural and marine, enhancing the natural and marine environment. All three themes have the overarching aim of delivering impactful and sustainable outcomes for society, economy, and the natural environment. All three themes contribute to the goal of delivering economic and environmental sustainability. Our conference today is organised with those three themes in mind. Session one, about enhancing sustainability and circularity within the Northern Ireland agri-food industry. We have a keynote address for, from Professor Sinead Waters on how feed additives can reduce methane emissions. Methane being one of the largest and most significant greenhouse gases. Alongside this, there are talks on the role that changes in pastoral farming can play. The opportunities and increasing opportunities from a circular bioeconomy, 
and how changes or improvements in livestock farming can contribute to meeting the environmental and sustainability goals. Session two is on the role of animal health in achieving our environmental goals. Northern Ireland is a livestock intense region. Animal disease and livestock mortality not only has an impact in terms of economic performance and animal welfare, but important also, also impacts on the environmental footprint of our industry. Our talks in this session look at how animal health links to environmental footprints, provides a local AFP perspective on the disease challenges that Northern Ireland faces, and examines how we might quantify the effects of animal health on the environmental uh, footprint. Session three looks at how we might optimize ecosystem services from our land and seas, and considers the impact of plant health, and importantly, the impact of plant health may have in terms of capture within the forestry section. It also deals with carbon sequestration in grassland and some of the things that may alter or affect that. An important role also of our aquatic ecosystems and the role that they play in carbon sequestration and storage. In conclusion, I hope that you find today's programme and discussion informative, interesting, maybe at times thought-provoking and importantly worthwhile as we aim to provide an outlook, an outlook looking forward and looking outwards on the challenge of carbon and beyond. Thank you very much. Many thanks uh, to Stanley. Uh, I'd now like to introduce uh, DERA's Permanent Secretary, Katrina Godfrey, for her welcome address. Thank you, Katrina. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Stanley. Um, it's absolutely great to be here with you all this morning, and it's such a privilege for me to help open the 2022 AFB Science Outlook Conference. I can't help feeling that today is a real opportunity for us, as Stanley was saying, to reflect not just on the challenges facing our agri-food sector and our natural environment, but more important, the opportunities that I'm convinced lie ahead for a sector and an environment that makes such a big difference to the lives and the well-being and the economy of everyone who lives here. I'd like to offer my congratulations to AFBE colleagues for putting together such an impressive conference programme. As Stanley was saying, the conference theme of Carbon and Beyond could not be more fitting. And for reasons that I'll come back to, it's great also to see that the very first session this morning brings with it a focus on leading innovation. But all of the topics you'll be discussing today with expert speakers from here and from much further afield are important and are relevant. And I don't doubt that there'll be fascinating discussions and debate, maybe the odd bit of disagreement, which is, I think, always healthy and good to see as you go through the day. And I'm also very conscious that with such an impressive range of speakers, you really don't want to have to listen to me for too long. But I did want to provide just a few reflections as we get today underway. I guess the first reflection that I have is really a reflection on what I've seen and what I've heard in my first six months in my current role. I've been both impressed and uplifted by this, the many conversations I've had since I joined DERA. Conversations with scientists and researchers, with students and lecturers, with farmers and food producers, with those charged with protecting and enhancing our environment and advocating for it, and with so many other people. They tell me a huge amount about the passion and the pride that's in this room and in the sectors that you all represent. And I think that stands us in really good stead for the future. And it is a challenging future. The second reflection I guess I must have is the very obvious one that it's me standing here before you today and not a minister. Um, I very much hope that it will not be very long before we have ministers back leading and directing the work of departments. It often seems to me that it cannot be right that in a partnership which is reliant on both the role of the minister and the role of the civil servant, it feels very, very odd when one of those partners is missing. Um, and I know that that gives all of us challenges as we work through the next few weeks and months, but hopefully we'll get to where we need to be in the not too distant future. And I'm also conscious that we face unprecedented challenges in terms of the cost of living and the cost of doing business. And that for so many businesses and so many families, 
those challenges are not abstract economic concepts. They're very real and they're very worrying. And it's in that context that we need to take forward the agenda that, that lies ahead of us. And to do that working in partnership across government with industry, with our NGO partners, and with so many others. And it's good to see that focus on collaboration very evident here today. Because of course, we do face together and we have to deal together with the impact of global warning, warming, did I say warning? Yes, it is a warning, um, and the consequences of climate change. And one of the big milestones since the last AFP Outlook conference is that Northern Ireland, of course, now has its own Climate Change Act passed by the Assembly in March and Royal Assent received in June. And that act, as Stanley was saying earlier, sets us on a course that requires Northern Ireland to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 and sets an interim target for a 48% reduction in emissions by 2030 based on 1990 levels. That is a huge challenge, particularly when you consider that over the 30 years to 2020, greenhouse gas emissions here reduced by just 24%. But it's a challenge that we can only meet head on. Our first major task under that new legislation, of course, is to develop Northern Ireland's first climate action plan, essentially a route map that shows how we're going to make progress against those carbon reduction targets. And that route map is going to require huge efforts. It's going to demand new policy interventions, new programs, new ways of doing things. And as I said earlier, it's only going to be possible through collaboration across so many parts of society and our economy here. But the other thing it's going to need is to be underpinned by science. And AFPE and indeed our universities are going to be crucial partners in that regard. And it's for that same reason that within the department, we've developed an ambitious science strategy framework to guide how we can optimize our investment in science. We've also established a science transformation program to ensure that we deliver on its goals of getting the best science, getting the best value from science, and making the best use of science. And through that science transformation program, we want to make sure that the science we commission and use is innovative, collaborative, and transformative. And we also want it to be applicable in the real world, able to support a healthy and sustainable economy, environment, and rural society. Many of you will know um, or may have spotted that last month our former minister, Edmund Putz, along with um, Simon Harris, the Irish Minister for Further Higher Education, Research, Innovation and Science, he's got an even longer departmental title than we have, um, and Nusrat Ghani, the UK Minister for Science and Investment Security, announced a £64 million investment to create new collaborative virtual research centres on climate and sustainable and resilient food systems across Ireland, Northern Ireland and Great Britain. And that's such a good example of our department working collaboratively with other funders, in this case, Science Foundation in Ireland and UKRI, to help deliver the step change in science to meet the challenges ahead and realise the opportunities for our agri-food sector and for our environment and rural communities. And even closer to home, a really good practical example of helping farmers to address environmental challenges and become more sustainable is, of course, the Soil Nutrient Health Scheme. And I know that AFBI is playing such a key role in managing what's a large and really innovative soil sampling scheme on behalf of the department. That scheme will provide farmers with detailed map-based information on soil nutrients, carbon and runoff risks, on which future farming decisions can be based. And I really believe that that scheme can be a game changer for all of us on multiple levels. I was absolutely delighted that the uptake in Zone 1 exceeded 90%. And I would like to say a huge thank you to those AFPI colleagues involved in the scheme, and indeed to the many of you in this room who advocated for it and who encouraged farmers to take up the opportunity to be part of it. That is just, I think, one example of how vital the science and research led by AFPI is for our future well-being. And when I say well-being, I mean environmentally, economically, and societally. And I think you'll hear so many more of those examples during the course of today. 
Sarah said at the start that all eyes are fixed at the moment on COP27, um, but I want to finish just by going back to COP26 because I remember reading something this time last year, um, and it was three key points that have stuck with me and that I think are really worth keeping in mind as we move forward with today's conference. And they are, science is crucial, it was said at COP26, to understanding how and why our climate is changing, the risks posed, and the solutions available. Innovation is essential to develop and scale solutions to limit global temperature rise and adapt to the current and the future impacts of climate change. And collaboration through an inclusive and multidisciplinary approach is needed if research and innovation is going to deliver technologies and solutions that are affordable, available and accessible to all. So as you get ready to listen to the fantastic speakers that AFPI has lined up for you, please do keep in mind the importance of all three of those, science, innovation and collaboration. They're going to have to be the key facets of my work in the months and years ahead and I hope they will also be of yours. Thank you and have a great day. Many thanks, uh, Katrina, for those wonderful uh, words of welcome. And yes, it's going to be all about science, innovation and collaboration today. Um, I also have to tell you that we are recording our event today. Uh, so for those who couldn't attend, there will be a copy available afterwards. So you'll be able to uh, spread the word about all the, the speakers that you've heard today and invite others to share in their knowledge and their presentations. Okay, so we come to our first session of the day right now. This is the leading session, leading innovations to enhance sustainability and circularity within the Northern Ireland agri-food industry. Now, I am going to hand over to our first chair of the day, no stranger to many people in the room, Director of the Sustainable Agri-Food Sciences Division, Professor Elizabeth McGowan. And Elizabeth will take it from here to outline the session and introduce the speakers and panelists. So over to you, Elizabeth. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you, Katrina, for such a welcoming and uplifting um, talk. It's always very good that our permanent secretary is very supportive of science <laughs> for those in the room. Um, so yes, I'm delighted today to take you through the first session, which is focusing on science for innovations. And I hopefully, as we go through this, we'll also demonstrate just how collaborative we are in that space as well. I had the pleasure of leading a consortium of UK academics um, recently, which really tried to model through the, the amount of methane emissions, greenhouse gas emissions that we could reduce from the UK livestock sector um, based on current and known technologies. And we were able to reduce about 24% from that due to current and known technologies. So that really just emphasizes the amount of work and research and innovation that is needed to be brought forward to drive that reduction even further in the next 10 to 20 years. So this session hopefully will give you a glimpse into what some of those innovations will be coming forward. So with no further ado, I'm going to first of all introduce Professor Sinead Waters. Now, for, life has really got up and going again and everybody's jetting all over the world now. So Sinead is actually at one of her project meetings, but she has pre-recorded her presentation for us, which we'll see in a minute. And Sinead completed her PhD um, at National University of Ireland in Maynooth, and she really focuses on gut microbiology and biotechnology. Her research programme is in the area of animal nutrition and focuses on nutrient digestion and utilisation of feed, particularly in pasture-based systems. So she has a huge reputation of the application of genomics technologies to address some of those key issues in agriculture, and most recently now the, the role of rumen microbiome in utilisation of feed and especially reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So Sinead, it will now present with the powers of technology and a virtual world, um, her presentation. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, so as they said, my name is Sinead Waters. Uh, I'm based at Chagask, uh, and I'm also co-chair of the Livestock Research Group of the Global Research Alliance for Agricultural Greenhouse Gas Emissions. 
Uh, and I'm delighted to be here today to talk about evaluation and development of feed additives to reduce enteric methane emissions from ruminants. Uh, and thanks so much for the invitation to talk at, at AFB Science Outlook Conference. Um, it's really a privilege to, to be take part in, in the meeting. So just by way of an introduction, Ireland is the fifth largest beef exporter in the world, exporting also about 85% of all our dairy outputs. So we're very much an agricultural based country. We're also a pasture based agricultural system. So agriculture is responsible for more than 37% of Ireland's greenhouse gas emissions, uh, according to our, our the EPA in our last year's uh, results. Uh, and also methane accounts for nearly 70% of all Irish agri greenhouse gas emissions. And according to the Ireland as uh, the uh, carbon uh, action plan, the climate action plan uh, 2021 and the climate action low carbon development bill, we are under strict legislation now to reduce agri emissions by 25% by 2030. As part of that, we will need to reduce methane emissions, especially in ruminant derived enteric methane by around 10%. So how are we gonna do this? We've set out a roadmap uh, to meet our greenhouse gas targets and especially to include reducing methane emissions. As part of this roadmap, uh, we will be able to deliver this uh, with the help of the Science po Signpost Programme. And this is a programme that Chagosk initiated with in industry partners, Borbia and lots of other uh, partners, which, is a, which helps to promote climate action by farmers. So it works hand in hand with farmers and it's a multi-annual campaign to promote uh, climate action uh, by all Irish farmers. And really this sets out our roadmap on, on the different actions we're going to deliver between, so we can actually reduce our greenhouse gas emissions from 2018 levels, right down to levels, uh, you know, reducing from 23 megatons CO2 equivalents down to between 16 and 18 uh, megatons equivalent CO2 equivalents by 2030, and then hopefully redu uh, reducing it sufficiently for climate neutrality in agriculture uh, by 2050. So methane emissions, uh, biogenic sources include uh, fermentation of feed, uh, rumen fermentation, um, management of organic wastes, manures, uh, and in Asia and other countries, um, we have you know, rice paddy cultivation. Agriculture, as I said, is responsible by for 37% of Irish greenhouse gas emissions, according to the EPA. And sources in Irish agriculture include enteric fermentation, which is roughly 60%, and then stored manures and slurries is the other source uh, of, of methane emissions. And reducing methane will be key to meeting our greenhouse gas targets on climate change. So how are we going to do it? Well, we have set out some, you know, uh, some actions along the way to try and achieve um, our, our targets, particularly for greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. The first is, and the most, I suppose, uh, uh, immediate that we can take is improved uh, management practices, or improving farm efficiency. And this is laid out in the Chagas Mac. As part of this, and these are basically actions that farmers can, can initiate right away, including, you know, uh, reducing the age of slaughter, as I've mentioned here, but, you know, enhancing the grassland management um, and other things that I'll talk about in a few minutes. The next area, which is a more long-term strategy, is breeding strategies. And Chagask and the ICBF are working hand-in-hand -hand to try and enhance both feed efficiency and lower methane emissions for a long-term approach. And for breeding, this is cumulative so uh, and long-term uh, and additive. So basically, this is a very good long-term strategy to have in place. However, we need more immediate strategies. The first of these, of course, is the feeding strategies. So... The first important one is improved grassland management and improved grass, improved quality of your pasture. As part of this, we also will need to apply uh, a, you know, strategies like feed additives. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, but we need to ensure these can be delivered during all types of, during the system at all times of the year. And particularly in Ireland, which is a pasture based country, as I mentioned, it would be critical that these could be delivered during grazing, during the grazing season. As part of this, we will need to develop slow release feed additives because all the feed additives that we've been looking at to date, majority of them have been have been developed based on indoor feeding systems where they're continuously fed. Another way to get over this issue would be early life supplementation. The main thing I'm going to speak about today is feed additives, but I'm going to place that in the context of the other strategies mentioned above, including the improved management practices. 
And just looking at the Chagas MAC curve, which states that we have, you know, which looks into improving farm management. And these are cost negative strategies. And just looking at these alone uh, allow will allow us to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by approximately 10 percent. And these extend these 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 in, entail extending the length of the grazing season, increasing dairy cow genetic merit, optimizing age of first calving, increasing the daily live weight gain, optimizing calving and lambing rate and lowering age of slaughter, which I spoke about there earlier, and improving waste management. And these, as I said, are laid out um, in, in the MAC curve. Reducing the age of slaughter is one of the of the um, actions that we are very interested in in, in Ireland at the moment, uh, and will be part of, of our of our one of our of our um, uh, um, of allowing us to help meet our, our targets um, on the climate action plan. And these include reducing the age of slaughter from 27 months to 24 months, and this would reduce greenhouse gas emissions by about 0.7 megatons of CO2 equivalents. Reducing the age of slaughter by about uh, 84 days could reduce it by, uh, in terms of, of um, methane emissions, by 19.3 kilograms of methane per animal. Uh, and of course, if you less, if the animal is around for you know less time, uh, there's less greenhouse gas associated with the manure, also reducing the manure, methane, and into all. Also, these methods, there are methods to improve average daily gain, which uh, would allow us to meet our targets in terms of the animal's weight earlier. So the animal spends less time on farm um, and you get your, your animal weight to the correct targets. Um, these include improvements of animal health, grassland management uh, and animal breeding. These will be critical to allowing us to reduce the age of slaughter. So the national strategies that are in place to enhance earlier age of slaughter include the Beef Data Genomics Programme, new genetic evaluations for age of slaughter, the beef environmental efficiency uh, program or the beef program. And of course, we will depend on industry led premiums for earlier finishing animals. <clears throat> Breeding will be a very important uh, strategy uh, to allow us to reduce methane emissions uh, from agriculture. So already we have a number of projects uh, involved in this area. For our group in Grange, we have um, the um, master project, which is from the EU funded by the EU Horizon, and before that, Rumen Predict, uh, which was funded through Airgas uh, and led by, by Sharon Hughes um, in Queen's University Belfast. And really, already to date, we have enteric methane emissions and performance data collected on over a thousand beef cattle through these projects. Uh, we have also developed a, a, an optimal trait uh, for ranking beef cattle in terms of methane emissions. And this is a new trait called residual methane emissions. And you can read all about that in the paper here on the side uh, by Paul Smith, uh, one of my former PhD students. And we found in that study that low residual methane emission meeting animals produce about 30 percent less methane uh, and, uh, of course, less uh, methane per gram per kilogram carcass weight or methane intensity. Also, just genomic predictions for methane output are currently being formulated by the Irish Cattle Breeding Federation through the Beef Data and Genomics uh, Programme, which is key to national rollout. Um, and also higher genetic merit animals will have significantly lower methane output per day. So increasing genetic merit of these animals will in turn result in the, in the methane output being lower. Also, it's estimated from work of Cromie uh, et al. from ICBF that animal breeding is estimated to deliver 1% annual reduction in CO2 equivalents, uh, which, which would be very, very useful in this context. And also new carbon sub-index is being delivered for national dairy breeding program. And this is just uh, an image of, of the Tully Performance Testing Station in County Kildare, uh, run by the Irish Cattle Breeding Federation, which we collaborate with very closely and where a lot of this work has been completed. Now to get on to the, the topic uh, met, uh, of the feed additives and just to introduce one of the projects that I lead called Methabate. And this uh, is really the aim of the project is to develop novel farm ready technologies to reduce methane emissions from pasture based Irish agricultural system. Uh, and through this project, I collaborate with colleagues at uh, Queen's University Belfast, National University of Ireland Galway, which is now University of Galway uh, and AFP in Northern Ireland. Um, and this project is now in its third year. So basically, the aim of the project is to is to develop feed additives to mitigate methane emissions, while at the same time monitoring their effects on animal productivity in sheep and cattle. We plan to develop encapsulation or slow <coughs> release options uh, to, to deliver these uh, feed additives at pasture. And also what's going to be critical is the nutritional and the toxicological composition, 
uh, of the feed additives uh, in, of meat and milk following feeding of these feed additives and to confirm consumer safety and ensure that there's no residues following feeding of the additives. Also, we might need to make sure that the feed additives and generation of the feed additives uh, is by using sustainable, sustainable methods. So this will be carried out using the Chagas life cycle analysis metal, methods and models. And also we'll assess the farm level cost effectiveness of the feed additives through the National Farm Survey in, in Chagas. So the first set of studies we carried out was looking at in vitro studies. So really looking at feed additives in the lab to see if they reduce methane emissions uh, before we actually go to larger animals that are more expensive um, and you know, the trials that take longer um, to do to carry out. So we use the Russi Tech system uh, in the laboratories in Grange, which involves using rumen fluid source from cannulated cattle. The experimental time frame was 21 days. Uh, and data and sample collection uh, was carried out. We looked at numerous traits of pH, total gas and methane. And we also looked at digestibility and we collected rumen fluid for subsequent uh, rumen microbiome analysis and VFA studies. And we evaluated numerous feed additives, including potential feed additives, including seaweeds, red, brown and green, seaweed extracts, olive feeds and oils and plant extracts. Uh, and of course, um, halides that we're de developing with our colleagues, uh, our, our industry partners, Glasgow Port Bio and University of Galway, which are short lived reactive oxidizing methane inhibitors. And I'll talk more about these as, as the presentation goes on. So you can see here some of the more um, promising results included the halide species, which were reducing methane emissions in vitro by between 60 and 70 percent. Uh, seaweed extracts, um, and also the Asparagopsis taxiformis, which we'd also expect to be, which is a red seaweed, um, which reduced methane emissions by 68%, and that's well recorded in the literature. <clears throat> also, Ascophyllum nodosum and its extract um, reduced methane emissions by around 36% and 15% respectively. Then we performed a number of animal trials, uh, including sheep and beef, uh, trials and some of the beef trials are currently ongoing uh, in Chagas Grange. So these included uh, trials on feed additives such as agalin, mutral, oils, the oxidizing methane inhibitors, which are the halides, seaweed and seaweed extracts. In the beef, we performed um, um, trials on in seaweeds, uh, seaweed extracts, oils, the halides and 3 NOP. Uh, and the length of the trials were four weeks acclimatization period, followed by 12 weeks feed supplementation. We did a lot of sampling during the, the trials also, and we ensured that there was forage inclusion uh, or it's a TMR type ration. Also, there's some da subsequent dairy um, trials that were carried out are ongoing in, in Chagas Moor Park. So we looked at the uh, feed additive of Beauvais. Many of you might may have heard of this feed additive, um, and it's 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 shown in the literature to reduce methane emissions by approximately thirty percent. And we tested Beauvais um, in Chagas Grange between September twenty twenty one and January twenty twenty two, and we had a very well uh, powered study with uh, thirty four animals per group. Uh, again, we had a four week climatization period followed by twelve weeks supplementation. We had 30% forage in the form of silage um, in the diet. We had dairy beef cross animals that were approximately six months of age uh, for young animals. And preliminary data from these trials shows that it consistently reduced uh, methane emissions by between 25 and 30%. Um, and, and this is with, with forage in the diet with no negative in effects on intake or gain. Um, and a subsequent uh, trial has been performed also in dairy cattle. So then looking at these new uh, feed additives, the oxidizing methane inhibitors. We've done a lot of work in collaboration with Glassport Bio and University of Galway uh, on developing these feed additives from the lab right through to the animals. And these are synthetic compounds. They're peroxide-based methane inhibitors. And they control the rumen oxidation reduction potential using mild oxidizing reagents. And these are safe to use. They're even used for human uh, consumption. So these are like urea perox uh, hydrogen peroxide or a combination of mild oxidizing agents with halides such as potassium oxide. And the mechanism of action is, is dual. It's, it's our, 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 it has many um, mechanisms of actions, including the ORP is increased selectively uh, and temporarily inhibiting methanogens. Uh, it also inhibits a uh, microbial enzyme necessary for, for methanogenesis and introduces oxygen into the rumen, which further acts to reduce the activity uh, of ruminal methanogens. 
Also, I spoke earlier about so release options. So again, as we said, Ireland is very much a pasture based country. Um, and, and grass is our advantage. So, so we need to make sure that any feed out of that successful can be applied uh, during pasture, uh, during grazing systems uh, while animals are out of pasture. So a lot of the feed additives that we've assessed to date are through indoor feeding and they've been fed directly after or during feeding. So we need, uh, they need to be continuously fed. And this is where the biggest issue with grazing occurs. So we need to develop new formulations for extensive grazing application. Uh, and this has been done with, with Glassport Bio and University of Galway, where we're developing encapsulation uh, so that it can be daily, um, daily, fed daily, or slow release uh, room and bolus for one to three months. And the variety of formats being tested um, in replicated trials, mainly in vitro, and this, with this consistent reductions in vitro shown with these uh, oxidizing um, methane inhibitors by around 50%, with no impact, negative impact on digestibility. And the initial indications are very positive um, and stable formats are suitable for incorporation into rations. And we have since actually tested these um, in beef cattle, both in fistulated cattle um, and now in a beef trial uh, with very promising results. And this is what some of them look like for the slow release options. And we can see the sustained uh, effect in vitro of the uh, of the feed additives uh, for in terms of reducing methane emissions over time. So just some preliminary results. I mean, we haven't uh, we're in the process of, of, of developing our papers at the moment for publication. Um, but just looking at some of the from the animal trials to date and the beef cattle, uh, brown seaweeds are reducing methane emissions only by about three percent, seaweed extracts by approximately 10%. Linseed oil has been quite successful in reducing methane emissions by approximately 20%. 3NOP, as I said, 25 to 30%. And the oxidizing methane inhibitors being fed twice a day in a pellet, which will really be advantage, advantageous to the farmers. Um, and also, <coughs> it's more a slow release option that it can be fed twice a day, has been uh, successfully reducing methane emissions um, between 20 and, and 30%. Now, this trial is ongoing, so these are very much uh, preliminary results. Uh, and I'm looking forward to our colleagues in Queens and AFPI doing similar trials um, on these feed additives very soon through the Metabate project. Another area that we're interested in exploring is area life interventions. So this involves supplementing calves or younger animals earlier in life uh, and that you could see persistent effects through life, which would prevent us from needing to feed um, feed animals continuously, particularly when animals are grazing. So <clears throat> the first month of life presents a time frame during which the rumen microbiome becomes established. So this first month of life, uh, from data from our own stuff, our own group uh, and colleagues in, in Israel and other areas shows that this particular time period uh, plays the biggest part in influencing the adult microbiome. And there's lasting effects on the rumen functionality, including methanogenesis, which can really extend into later life. So it's this period of time that's critical, the first month of that shapes that microbiome. In the study by Mil et al. from INRA, they showed that early life administration of an oral dose of dairy calves with 3NOP from birth uh, to 14 weeks of life, you know, did result in a reduction of methane emissions, which persisted to 12 months of age. So they could still detect these reductions in methane emissions um, a year later. This resulted in around 150 kilograms of CO2 equivalents per head of these cattle during the first year of life. So we're hoping to, to replicate some of these studies to see if we can, we can do these in Ireland uh, with, uh, with a range of feed additives that you know, should be shown to be successful through the Mete Bay project. And also before I finish up, I'd like to talk about some of the international uh, reports. So as I said, I'm co-chair of the Livestock Research Group of the Global uh, Research Alliance for, for Agriculture Greenhouse Gas Emissions. And we, uh, the GRA, along with a range of other uh, organizations and institutions, have carried out an international a report. It was Roger Hegarty, that, a very well-known scientist, that led this report where they evaluated uh, there was an evaluation of evidence for efficacy and applicability of methane inhibiting feed additives for livestock. And out of the report on all publications to date, the only two feed additives that were successful were 3NOP and um, Asparagopsis or the red algae. Um, and we found similar results in Ireland, I have to say. And they outlined in this report, and these are just two points I'd like to make, is the constraints around feed additives are the insufficient evidence of a co-benefit 
of increased uh, production. So basically, if a farmer is trying to trying to convince a farmer to use a feed additive, if, particularly if it's going to be at a cost, uh, we need to be able to show that there is a core benefit um, in terms of production, be it average daily gain or milk production or enhanced feed efficiency. Uh, and to date, there isn't sufficient evidence to show that. And the second thing is that studies rely on feed additives being mixed into total mixed rations. So again, and this is what we'd find ourselves, that these feed additives have been fed continuously and there's been not much evidence uh, in the literature on how much mitigation can be achieved in extensive our grazing systems. And to date, it's been very, very little evidence to date uh, compared to in indoor systems. So this is where the research needs to, to happen. Uh, and furthermore, just maybe to add to that, is getting this data into our national inventories and how do we account for the data in the inventories in terms of using feed additives on farm, which would be a third that I would like to, to add there as well. Also, just to make you aware that there's a new GRA flagship on feed additives, which is led by uh, David Yanis Roos um, from Spain and Andre Banik um, from um, uh, Andre Banik in Wageningen in the Netherlands. And they're basically, um, this, feed additive, this uh, feed additive GRA flagship uh, is going to look at developing technical guidelines to develop feed additives to reduce enteric methane emissions. Uh, and they're basically going to assess all the studies to date and some, some trials. Uh, they're not going to carry any trials within the project, but trying to give guidelines on you know, how to use feed additives and in what systems. So I would welcome those of you working on feed additives to get involved in these flagships. Uh, this flagship is it's going to be very interesting. The results will be very useful for us uh, across the world. So to summarise, uh, methane is a potent agricultural uh, greenhouse gas. There is national and international commitments to significantly reduce methane emissions from agriculture. It's really urgent at this stage. Um, and by using, by having improved farm efficiency, improved grassland management, um, diet supplementation with feed additives and breeding strategies, um, these are currently being investigated as possible strategies Working together, is not any one one uh, prong is going to work. We have to really work together as part of this. Uh, it'll be a synergistic effect that will ultimately reduce methane emissions from agriculture. Um, there's some promising feed additives being assessed uh, within uh, the Metzibate project and other projects uh, using a systematic approach for methane mitigation potential. But these will need to be applied further and research needs to be carried out to develop slow release options for these uh, promising feed additives so they can be, they can be applied during grazing. Is there a potential for air life intervention? We don't know that yet. Further studies need to be carried out um, in terms of uh, manipulating the microbiome and area life. So this would have a, a longer term effect um, on reducing methane emissions uh, from agriculture. And the important point I'd like to make is we do need an international effort to really solve these problems so that feed additives can be assessed across the world in different systems and that we can all all um you know help each other out to and th that there's actually um you know a major effort done in this regard that the feed additives are assessed across different types of systems and i'd like to end by acknowledging uh, the team in Jagusk and also our collaborators in university college dublin and university of galway um for their support in these projects and also our funders for our EU Horizon 2020, the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marines, um, SFI, our partners, ICBF, uh, our industry partners, DSM, uh, and the other uh, industry partners um, sharing our feed additives with us for assessment. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Sinead, very much. And I think you all would hopefully agree that has given us a lot of hope, you know, that not only that there are options, but actually Ireland is very well serviced with a real breadth of expertise between Sinead in Chagas, Sharon Hughes in Queens and our own Shanghai Yan at AFBE. We're, we're actually very fortunate in Ireland to have such a deep um, knowledge of expertise and capability across the island to tackle methane emissions through feed additives. As Sinead said, um, it's going to take a toolbox of um, a hammer and a, a chisel and a, and a wrench, etc., to actually solve this issue of reducing greenhouse gases. And that's why in this session we're going to now lead on to David Patterson. So as we've heard about feed additives to tackle emissions from the animal, David now, as our head of agronomy in AFBE, um, spent a bit of time doing his PhD on agronomy, went to Caffey in Queens for a little spell, and then returned to AFBE, which was great, um, back in, what was it, 20, 2018. 
and uh, heads up our grassland agronomy program now, which of course has a major focus on land management, grassland management to reduce emissions and increase biodiversity, etc. So, as I say, it's going to be a toolbox of, of uh, solutions, and David's now going to bring us some ideas with regards to how to manage our grassland in that toolbox. Thank you, David. Thank you, Elizabeth, for that introduction and uh, for this opportunity to speak to the conference today. Good morning, everyone. It's, it's nice to be in a live conference. Um, so in keeping with the, uh, the, 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 the title, as you can see there, take the specs off. Keeping with that title, I want to consider the, the future of our largest farming asset uh, within the livestock industry, namely grassland, um, and what that future holds we need to consider, uh, maybe turn this, this title here into a question. Can grassland farming turn over a new leaf? But to answer that, first of all, I think we need to consider the present situation. Um, our grassland covers about 95% of our farmland area across Northern Ireland. It's comprised mainly of a range of grass species, both sown species and unsown species. Um, as well as broadleaf weeds and a low level of, of legumes. But most seed mixtures that we've used in our reseeding over the years and decades has been largely based on perennial ryegrass varieties. So really, our grassland has ended up being largely a grass-only type of monoculture, as we would refer to it, and uh, it's regularly uh, to sustain its productivity and its performance is reliant on regular inputs and applications of chemical nitrogen fertilizer. So that's one downside, and another downside is that it has ended up also with relatively low levels of biodiversity. So that's the present day. If we look to the future, um, what does the future outlook be for grassland? And it needs to be, as the slide shows there, it needs to be sustainable, a reliable resource for livestock farming systems, and to be resilient to deal with climate change and play its part in reducing the carbon footprint of agriculture. However, our grassland is already quite difficult. Before we change anything, it's already quite difficult to manage. Um, it's also very challenging to model its performance, as can be seen from our grass check graph at the base of the slide there. You can see the variability from year to year, and that's only over the last five years, um, and how drought has impacted more and more, especially on the eastern side of the province. Um, and also as well, uh, grass is not an arable crop. It's not a true monoculture. We still need much more uh, precise and much more accurate modeling of grass productivity uh, to be able to understand and predict the impacts of climate change and also to, to, to look at the grass composition and how its management might need to change for those future climate scenarios. It's also worth noting that our GB work uh, with grass check has now been extended and I think that brings terrific opportunities in the future to work with uh, a new set of farmers, new research partners, and also to extend our database of grassland information. And that'll only strengthen the overall research effort as we go forward. So what does the future of sustainable pastoral agriculture actually look like? Um, and uh, as I see it, we have to look at the, 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 the four areas. We have to consider the animal, its efficiency, its genetics, its behavior, and you've heard about some of that from, from Sinead already. We have to consider the climate and all of those weather shocks and, and uh, longer term changes. Look at the grassland itself in terms of its composition, uh, fixing nitrogen and maybe persistency issues, as well as the landscape where the, the, the ecosystem services come to bear in terms of the, the wider issues of soil health and water quality and biodiversity and so on. So we can't simply address any one of these in isolation of all of the others. We have to consider them together because they are all integrated at source. Um, so I think this underlines the need for this broader view um, and to look beyond carbon reduction measures, especially when it comes to the future of pastoral farming. 
So, as I see it, I think there are three key opportunities for grassland. Firstly, to lower the carbon footprint, also to deliver, to deliver other ecosystem service benefits, and to play its role in climate adaptation, especially when we think of our theme today of carbon and beyond. Um, and if we reduce the carbon footprint and reduce those nitrous oxide and methane emissions, we must not lose sight of doing that within the context of efficient, profitable livestock farming systems that can also deliver a range of those ecosystem services. Now, when you put all that together, that's a sizable challenge for the entire industry. Um, so today I want to look um, at, in particular at looking at uh, how we can increase species diversity in our grassland and how that can make a difference. Uh, firstly, through the use of legumes, step one. Second of all, by introducing herbs, step two. And finally, by introducing trees into the grassland uh, ecosystem or the grassland environment. So firstly, the question is, can clover cut carbon? And applications of chemical fertilizer, as you can see there globally, represent the single biggest source of nitrous oxide emissions in agriculture. So therefore, any contribution that we can substitute uh, with uh, uh, naturally occurring forms of nitrogen, such as biologically fixed nitrogen, must be considered. I should add that this doesn't take away anything at all from the, the good sound practice of nutrient management planning, helping farmers to tailor their fertilizer requirements to the, use, to the requirements of the crop and the soil and the field conditions. But there are very, very real opportunities already uh, for legumes such as use of red clover and white clover uh, with their nitrogen fixing ability to transfer that nitrogen from the air to the soil and then make it available for plant uptake companion plants such as grasses and herbs. But there are some downsides. Um, and some studies have already shown that less than 30% on some occasions of the fixed nitrogen from the legumes is uh, only 30% is available uh, for uptake by companion plants. And so there's a risk then of that some of that freely available nitrogen still in the soil uh, could be lost in other forms of nitrogen. And as well as that, there's the ongoing agronomic challenges, which are, comes closer to home in terms of establishing and maintaining the target levels of clover in a sward in the first place. So there are some challenges or, or downsides. But despite those concerns, I think thinking of the, the theme for today, carbon and beyond, I think the overall answer is yes. Um, it's basically free nitrogen. Um, that fixed nitrogen is considered both carbon and energy neutral. Um, and in terms of carbon footprint, our early LCA work that was done in AFBE, um, where they compared beef cattle grazing on a grass-only sward versus a grass clover sward, um, and the grass uh, was fed at 150 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, the result with the grass clover system was a 19% reduction in carbon footprint. A more recent work by Chagas and UCD have shown similar effects to that in dairy systems. But aside from clover, it's also been shown that proportions of legumes in the swords and the levels of species diversity um, also appears to have a, a further effect on greenhouse gas emissions. And with this in mind, I want now to move on quickly to step two, which is introducing further species diversity where grasses, legumes and herbs are combined into what has been commonly referred to nowadays as multi-species swords. So let's just have a look at their potential. Just a couple of quick photographs you can see on the left-hand side, that's a close-up of a grass clover sward. And on the right-hand side, all we've done is introduced the herbs into the equation. So it's species such as plantain and chicory on the right-hand side photograph. And in terms of their impact on greenhouse gas emissions, some of these studies are preliminary, they're relatively uh, young studies from a research point of view, but you can see the graph on the left hand side, first of all for nitrous oxide, and you can note the decrease in nitrous oxide emissions due to first of all reducing the amount of chemical fertilizer being added to a ryegrass only sward, and then a little bit further when you add in the, 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 the multi-species into the, into the sward, uh, an extra uh, reduction has been achieved as well. But 
preliminary research, but it's promising. In terms of methane, you can see on the far right-hand side graph, perennial ryegrass was compared to a, a number of different um, multi-species types of swords, and you can see a significant difference there in terms of reduced methane. There's other studies there where there was a report of 22% of reduction in methane emissions in lambs grazing a chicory-based sward versus a perennial ryegrass only type sward. And I should say that, uh, uh, as I've already uh, referred to, there's conflicting reports uh, from some of these early studies. So I think we still need to firmly establish exactly what sward mixtures deliver what level of reduction in greenhouse gases and what proportion of the species are contained in those swards. So there's, there's a lot more work to do. And in terms of some of our own results coming through from early, early studies at AFPI, um, you can see there on the graph uh, when we've compared the, the, the productivity, the, the yield of a multi-species sward versus each of the components that were in the sward, overyielding occurs. And that's not new for the concept of mixtures, but it's, it's very good to see that result coming through for multi-species as well. Um, so far, we've found similar levels of animal, perform animal performance when we've looked at uh, dairy cross uh, cattle grazing either a grass clover sward or a multi-species sward. Although I should say the grass clover sward was particularly good as well. Um, we've also found greater biodiversity beneath the surface in terms of the earthworm pop populations and we'll see a photogra photograph of that in a moment. Um, top right of the slide, you can see there, it's a stylized uh, uh, graph, but what it shows you is the what I refer to as species complementarity of these three different species groups. Whenever the grass, which is the green line, whenever the grass has kind of passed its peak of performance in, in the sort of midsummer period, that's exactly when the clovers and the herbs are starting to contribute more and more to the sward, so you get a much more balanced effect throughout the growing season. There's also opportunities for extended grazing season as well. So those complementary growth rhythms, I think, are something that can also uh, potentially lead to some better climate adaptation when we think of dealing with weather shocks. And in the eastern side of the province, there's been three droughts, significant droughts, I would say, in the last five years. So that is something that could be particularly useful to address that. And thinking of below ground again, the roots, apologies for the, the, the photographs of the plants are good here, but I don't like my hands. The, uh, the grass white clover sward on the left hand side showing relatively uh, shallow rooting. And as you go further across by adding in the plantain and then adding in the chicory, you get deeper and stronger root development uh, beneath the surface. And that again uh, will have uh, knock-on benefits for perhaps greater drought tolerance, but we first of all need to know how these root dynamics function uh, beneath the surface and how they contribute also to, to uh, soil health and soil structure. Should also emphasize that perennial ryegrass hasn't been forgotten. Um, it'll still be a key component of these swards um, because the clovers are feeding the ryegrass, which gives the, the sward productivity and the benefits in terms of animal performance. And that's always central. Um, but we need to consider uh, maybe future breeding directions. And our colleagues at AFPI Gall are considering this for building in greater climate resilience to our perennial ryegrass varieties, alongside the already good performance in terms of outright yield and uh, persistency traits and so on. And just to illustrate the below ground effects in terms of the earthworm populations, you can see there that the higher populations of uh, uh, the deep burrowing types of earthworms under the multi-species swards compared with any of the other any of the other sward types. Early results, but quite promising. And finally, just on the multi-species side, um, they have the potential. Uh, and I emphasize have the potential to be more drought tolerant and exhibit greater biodiversity and animal health benefits as well. Um, however, most of this research has been done, uh, most of the research done already in the Northern Hemisphere uh, is relatively recent. Um, some findings are a bit conflicting, 
um, and indeed the recent AFB Ag, uh, EcoSward project has identified, I think we talked up about 30 significant research gaps were identified, such as the need to understand and improve how that persistency, especially of some herbs, is, 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 is going to be resolved, how to mitigate animal bloat issues, and how to quantify accurately and consistently uh, greenhouse gases and benefits to soil health and soil carbon and water quality, all within real grazing and silage type environments. Okay? I think that's the challenge for, for research going forward. So despite the recent wave of interest in using multi-species swords, I think there is a significant amount of caution required uh, to give time for the studies that have already started and that are about to start to give us time to, to, to uh, build these multidisciplinary uh, studies and uh, do this before we encourage a more widespread adoption across the, the, the farming industry. So we've done the legumes, we've done the multi-species. The third and final, maybe the brave step, is to add in even greater species diversity and looking to harness the potential of integrating woodland into our grassland farming systems in order to take up you know, that, the benefit of the extra carbon uh, whilst producing valuable timber as well. And the AFB log gall site shown in the photograph there was established in 1989 and uh, ever since has been monitoring a range of uh, ecosystem service benefits uh, by combining grass, trees and livestock. Just some very brief results from some of those studies um, from Jim McAdams' work. First of all, AFB results show that there's a significantly higher amount of carbon stored in that upper soil layer um, on the fine particles within the soil under the silver pasture compared with grassland. And when you consider the carbon stored in the wood as well, um, these systems have the potential to store that longer term carbon. And in terms of carbon sequestration, you can see there at a glance that the silver pastures almost uh, uh, sequestering carbon at a rate of just under two and a half tons of carbon per hectare per year. It's also worth noting, and was mentioned earlier, the Soil Nutrient Health Scheme is now underway and uh, will cover the entire province over the next four years which won't just enable farmers to uh, uh, optimize their crop nutrient applications, but with the LIDAR technology and the soil carbon sampling, so, uh, sampling beneath the surface and so on, that will allow us to identify the carbon stocks uh, right across the farms of Northern Ireland. And the Arc Zero project as well uh, is, is, is well underway, assessing carbon stocks also on a number of commercial farms. So again, just thinking beyond carbon, uh, with integrating of trees into grassland. Um, there's a range of ecosystem service benefits there. I won't go through them all, um, but just to highlight one or two, extended grazing. Because of the changes to the soil physics and structure, um, when you combine trees and grass, uh, you have benefits in terms of that trafficability, um, practical things like that. And extended grazing was mentioned earlier in mitigations. Um, greater biodiversity is a, a, another key one, um, as well as the soil carbon benefits, okay? And just looking at some of the biodiversity results that have come through from AFB Loch Gall. The AFB results clearly show there are significantly higher populations of that range of macro and micro fauna um, and under the, the, the silver pastoral systems. Um, you can see as well, just from those graphs, that there's almost a sweet spot to be achieved somewhere between grass only being not so good for biodiversity through to pure woodland on the other side, not so good, somewhere in the middle. The silvo pasture combination is just getting the right density of tree planting and making it practical and workable within a farming system is, is, the, is the challenge for, for, for research and industry to work together on that. So maybe a, a slightly controversial photograph to finish on. Um, I think in conclusion that uh, increasing uh, species diversity using the leg, legumes and the herbs and trees in our pastoral farming systems, it has the potential uh, to deliver significant benefits for carbon, uh, but also can go beyond in terms of enhancing the natural environment in which we farm. Okay, thank you.
Thank you, David, very much. And uh, we'll keep moving on. In AFPI, we have a very diverse range of scientists and, and disciplines. And uh, David has shown us that the, the pastoral um, aspects of, of our farmland. Chris Johnson is now going to uh, give us a slide which will provoke our thoughts on other land-based uses um, other uses for our land-based sector. So Chris began working in AFBI in, in 2012 and has a real passion for the circular economy and uh, linking renewable energy with the environmental agenda. So Chris, delighted if you could now come and give your talk. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you, AFBI, Chairman and Board, for the invitation to speak. It's a... Um, it's, um, Real, real honour, in fact, thank you. Um, could you make my pictures as big as possible? <laughs> <laughs> the eyesight isn't what it used to be. My talk today is basically about opportunities for the agri-land sector. So it's, it's really, I'm taking in the bioenergy and the circular economy to really focus on. It hasn't always been, I suppose, the number one priority for Northern Ireland agriculture, but I wanted to introduce some ideas and some thoughts and some work we've been doing. So over the last number of years, we're well aware of strategy and policy development. You know, we hear, we hear about sort of the, the net zero strategy from Bayes and GB and how we must have a systemic transformation approach. And then we're well aware of the green growth document and the DERA innovation strategy, which make great reference to, you know, a transformation bioeconomy and uh, you know, bioresources, uh, organic materials. And carbon, we must understand, can come from nowhere else other than the agri-land sector. And this is really what we need to focus on. At the end of last year, the Department for Economy have been very progressive in developing roadmaps for, for net zero carbon energy. You know, we have, we have uh, you know, uh, a, 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 basically, you know, energy systems that must be current and future generations must be clean and must be carbon neutral. So we have a, we have a lot of policy coming down from there. And then we're well aware of the 10X economy and the economic recovery, you know, post, post COVID, giving opportunities for for energy and growth and jobs and everything green and let's de-link ourselves from fossil fuels and achieve this net zero 2050. So that's the bottom line really. But I want to say it's not just about the whole uh, net zero strategy. We also have individual focuses on aspects of potential agriculture like biomass crops. And right from back in 2016, you'll recognize a document on the left, the agri-land management strategy. You know, there was clear recognition that in one way or the other, biomass crops and energy crops can play a role going forward through into the net zero 2050 from Bayes. The Committee on Climate Change even mentioned that they expect to see about 260,000 hectares of of, of cropland, uh, agricultural land converted to biomass crops. I know that's possibly not what everyone likes to hear, but as well as that, you know, other less favorable land areas also have the opportunity to be converted into um, diverse crops that can be carbon resources, biomaterials, energy crops. And these are then um, manifested through, if you like, into a, an investment which UK government, the Obeys, have done. Um, uh, recently they've invested in. I'm going to focus on that a little bit more, but it's very much a focus on trying to develop the whole sector of biomass crops. So it's worth getting an overall picture. What are we talking about here as well? When we're talking about energy, we, we immediately think, okay, the, the decarbonisation, we're doing quite well in this. Well, the total, the total energy use in Northern Ireland, 52,500 gigawatt hours. That's what we use. And in quite rightly, we hear some good messages, which we have done recently with COP27 going on, that Northern Ireland has decarbonized nearly half of our energy. It's a really good message. And to be fair, we are sort of one of the world leaders in this. But what we need to understand is we're decarbonizing 47% of our electricity. It's our power. We're blessed with natural resources. We've got wind. You know, we've got 47% of the, of the electricity that we're producing is coming from wind. We've got PV. We've got some AD. We've got some turbines. So we are blessed by our natural resources, but we need to understand that is 47% of the electricity. We still have these big areas of transport and heat which we need to decarbonize, which is the bulk. It's 84%, 86% for the remainder. And we haven't really gone that far in those. Maybe about 2% of transport we've decarbonized, maybe three, four, tops 5% of heat we've decarbonized. And these are the, de the hard to decarbonize areas which we need to focus on. And this is where the agri landscape, the agri land area can come into play because this is where the role of bioenergy and biomethane and biomass and hydrogen and sustainable energy cropping and biomass cropping can come into play. 
We are aware of anaerobic digestion in Northern Ireland. We, we are quite successful at it, in fact. We've got between 70 and 80 operating AD plants um, and it's producing electricity. But biomethane can do a whole lot more and AD can do a whole lot more. And I'm touch, touching on things like, okay, power, we can produce power, but actually we can really try to get a hold of our fuel costs and our energy security. And we all know what energy security is this year. If we didn't know before this year, we all know what it is now energy cost, and if we didn't think energy was unaffordable, we all do, we know, know this now. Um, there's decarbonizing industry, decarbonizing transport. Uh, there is also decarbonizing businesses. We still, uh, and, and also domestic properties, we still do heat the majority of our homes in Northern Ireland on fossil fuels, mainly oil as well, but an increasing number on the gas grid. So gas is important. Natural gas is what we rely on. Biogas could well be the future. And then an important point to get around here as well, is if we can develop a kind of a more cohesive sort of bioenergy sector, including when in developing AD, we can give the agricultural sector an opportunity then for nutrient management, for safe management of nutrient, for, uh, for harnessing that, that nitrogen, for harnessing that phosphorus, because we're relying on the agri residues and wastes from agriculture. So it gives those opportunities. And I do want to keep, keep that one open. The picture in the bottom right there, I think is just, just worth looking at. That's a kind of just a heat map of showing where the potential collectible energy from across Europe actually comes from. But the darker the color, the more opportunity there is. And we can see that we're very firmly up there with the, with the northern France, with Holland, as we know, with Denmark. Um, so we do have those resources. So as well as having wonderful wind um, for, for electricity, we do have agricultural resources as well for bioenergy. And I want to focus on that. Questions are, though, if we do focus on this, is there actually enough bioresources in Northern Ireland to re really make a difference? And by make a difference, we mean substitute as much of that current energy that we're currently using, that bioenergy, oh, sorry, that, that natural gas and oil that we're currently using. So to do that, we were involved, I'm just gonna spend a few, few slides on this. We were involved in a Queens-led project through the Center of Advanced Sustainable Energy to kind of really look into this from a model perspective using geospatial analysis. Um, the top scenarios, I've just put, put them up in sort of diagrammatic detail, but the very top one is business as usual. It's what we currently do. We, we, we um, you know, breed our animals, we have the slurries, the manures, and we spread them back out, out onto land. And we're not doing an awful lot more in between, but what if we try to harness as much of that housed material as we possibly can do through the, through the year and make a concerted effort to then digest that um, into biogas, clean up the CO2, make biomethane, and then use that biomethane to displace natural gas. That's really what we tried to model here. Then we went a step further, and we said, well, let's take all that digestate that's coming out the back end. Actually, there are ways and technologies to develop even more energy out of that. Um, and then, of course, it gives us the opportunities to play into a circular economy as far as uh, fertilizers go, as far as nitrogen goes, as far as phosphorus goes, um, even the organic matter, which can be redistributed. So it gives us those opportunities. So r I'm summarizing quite a lot of slides in these two pictures, but again, it's a kind of a heat map, so the dar darker the color, the more the intensity. The picture to the left shows the biogas potential from housed animal livestock on the left-hand side, and we can see that we can get about 250 million cubic meters of biomethane from that, modeled, okay, it's modeled, okay? The one on the right shows, and again, it's a, it's a word that not everyone agrees with, but excess silage, excess nutrient crop, excess production of carbon materials, carbon resources from the land that could indeed go into energy production as well. So it's pulling that, and we can see we can get another 500,000 cubic meters of biogas from that particular land. And just by sort of a, a weird coincidence, that total 7,500 gigawatt hours is more or less exactly what is currently, or what was in but 2020, going through the gas grid in Northern Ireland. So those figures look to be feasible. They look to be, okay, this is something we need to look at a little bit more. It's never a perfect world. So we, went, we said, let's bring a little bit of reality into this and say, right, well, let's look at where the gas grids are. So uh, this, was, this was new to me when I saw this diagram first. These are the gas grids across Northern Ireland. Um, and within these gas grids, we, we said, right, well, let's take it like a, a feasible 10 kilometer distance somewhere that we could actually transport dewatered slurries, manures, bioresources, biomaterials, energy crops. Let's look at a 10 kilometer radius and let's see now what that does in terms of collection. And we can see that the, the figures are down a bit, but we can still produce 27% from the slurries, but 53%. Overall, we can, we can displace by modeling 81 to 82% for that total gas. That's used. And this is just slurry. We're not talking about other, agri other wastes, other organic wastes, um, you know, uh, 
domestic waste, we're not talking sewage sludge even, we're not talking any of those other materials, but this is showing a significant uh -huh. contribution. And I think what's interesting as well is out of those different gas grids, 11 of them are completely uh, sufficient in terms of production and usage. So they would be exporters to elsewhere. So of course the big ones would be sort of Belfast, Derry, Fermanagh because of its industry and Larne as well. They wouldn't have enough gas actually be, be able to be generated from those areas. Um, so the story is so far really when we come to the end of that piece of, piece of work, um, and I've got the, the logos of the, of the involved industry partners in that as well, is that there is significant opportunity to use an AD to decarbonize and also then to manage secondary livestock materials. Secondary benefits of ammonia and phosphate control can be realized. And from that, and I'll get on to it, I'm talking about the implementation of end of pipe technologies and technologies that we haven't really investigated to any great degree in Northern Ireland yet, but the opportunities are there. Um, the question you're probably thinking is, okay, well, look, this, is, this is interesting, this is new, but is anybody else doing that or are we making a massive risk? No, other people are doing this as well. Um, you know, in the Republic of Ireland, okay, they're not as far ahead with their AD sector, but there's a big momentum and a big dialogue and we're hearing about big investments coming up. Um, uh, in GB, yes, the 3.3 terawatt hours being currently injected into the grid. Uh, we don't do it yet here. France have got a target 7 to 10%. Denmark are the the experts in this, they really are, you know, 40% of their current gas use is from biogas. And by 2040, I think it is, they intend to be completely non-reliant on imported gas. And I think that's probably a nice position to be in, and we all can understand why that would be the case. So, worth mentioning that. I have touched on nutrient management. Nutrient management is something that we, we need in, in agriculture, and it can give some real opportunities to reduce uh, you know, the unintended consequences, I suppose, from, from, from uh, this kind of a strategy. But to manage our nitrogen, to manage our phosphorus, to take the pressure off our land base. We know from the refocus report published a few years ago that the importation of phosphorus into Northern Ireland is way in excess of what is exported in Northern Ireland. So it's got to be going somewhere. So it's either building up in our soils or it's ending up in our environment. So we know we've got roles to play in nutrient management. And these are some really interesting technologies which as I say, we're not experimenting or not implementing yet to any great degree, but they can be dewatering technologies, thickening technologies, drying, densification. Uh, we've got uh, things like acidification, uh, nutrient stripping, um, and membrane. And th there's, there's a lot of technologies, and I'm thinking now within the next couple of years we're going to start to see some of these technologies actually implemented, and we can really kind of uh, you know, live with them evidence the fact that they can actually deliver the environmental benefits that we need from agriculture. So I think these opportunities are coming. I'm going to take a slight swing here back to carbon resources now um, from the land because um, following a little bit in what David was saying there, biomass crops, and I touched it from the, on the Bayes uh, promotions earlier in the, in the slide, we've been quite involved in biomass crops in AFPI over the last number of years and I've put some, some of my kind of favourite research platforms, if you like, down in pictures. Um, the, the, the Going clockwise, top left, we're, we are demonstrating and evidencing whether indeed the outline in the agri-land management strategy that biomass crops can not only uh, you know, diversify agriculture, draw down carbon, provide a fuel, but also protect water quality. So we're actually evidencing that in, a, in an EU-funded project called Catchment Care. Um, likewise associated with a, a Queens-led PhD hub uh, called the Brighton Centre. We've published quite a lot actually on the evidence of what willow plantations can do integrated within a livestock uh, farming uh, zone, what they can actually do in terms of not only water quality protection, nutrient removal, nutrient, nutrient runoff abatement, but also in terms of global warming potential and greenhouse gas emissions. It's an interesting one. Bottom right, we're doing some work with the Environments Agency on how indeed nature-based solutions such as select, select species can be implemented to to reduce the effect and reduce the potency of discharges from society, whether they are wastewaters or whether they are indeed landfill leachates. And can those kind of technologies be implemented on landfills? And actually industry is really interested in this one as well. But can these kind of technologies be implemented in landfills to reuse those land areas that are currently kind of you know, kept out of any, any production really? Uh, to manage landfill leachates in a sustainable and low carbon way. And then bottom left is a project we're involved with that's led by Limerick University, which is, which is um, 
developing the uh, sort of phytoactives actually from salic species for for um, uh, topical dressings for sort of human and, and, uh, and animal health. And that's a really interesting one. It's early days, but actually there are some really interesting compounds which have already been isolated. And there's a prototype of a cream that's already been made. So to me, that's a really good opportunity for a bioeconomy. For example, if that particular crop could actually produce something of high value, there's nothing derived from oil, there's nothing derived from fossil fuel, we're completely going in the bioresource way. The, the waste material from that particular project actually uh, is going into producing materials, packaging, uh, things like cups, dishes, horticultural equipment. There's quite a lot of nice circular economy add-ons. Um, just to mention, partly because I love the photograph so much, um, but this is the research platform of the diffuse runoff plantation that we have in Hillsborough. Some of you may have seen it when you drive up the avenue. Um, and we, we targeted that particular zone based on LIDAR and digital terrain modeling to intercept runoff from the land. So we planted this willow plantation. We manage it every two or three years. We use the biomass on site to displace fossil fuel from heating the, the, um, the dairy premises, the RP premises. Um, but we used one, there's one particular part of that which is a replicated uh, research zone, if you like, to see just over time, since about 2016, do we see any change in the discharge of, of nutrient? And actually, the bottom line is, and the preliminary results do actually show that there is, that it indicates an increasing difference in the average P export, total P export, between the grass and the willow plots. Now, we've, we've kind of, you know, pulled this project together as one project ends, we continue it, because we think it's a really important work, piece of work, and it very much does evidence some of the, some of the recommendations, you know, in the original agri-land management strategy. So I'm quite, quite liking that. So uh, just in, in a quick summary there, willow biopatient blocks, willows can complement agricultural systems, NMP exports to water can be permanently reduced, energy production can be up to 64 times greater, you know, the amount of energy it takes to get it and the amount of energy we pull back from it. You know, these, uh, these secondary bioenergy crops really have a role to play as I see it, and uh, 95% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions compared to oil, well that's the, um, uh, that's the bottom line there as well. And before I sort of finish up, we have been involved in these research projects in AFPI um, over the last... Uh, um, six, seven, eight years, I suppose, the ones I've gone through. And recently, I've mentioned Bayes have put 32 million into a, into a whole kind of band of research to try to develop biomass crops, to try to develop and push it out into the, into the sector. Because let's face it, the Committee on Climate Change do see biomass crops as part of the net zero 2050 solution. We need to get these carbon resources from somewhere. We are, we are now part of this project. In fact, we're involved in three of them and we're leading one of them which I think is a good testament of, of kind of AFPI's capability in this sector. Um, the picture on the right, the project on the right, uh, which is led by uh, UKCEH, and it involves our colleagues in, in Ibers in Wales, SIUC in Scotland, Rothamsted in Harpenden, um, and then a couple of other players. Uh, it, it is all about a multi-demonstration multi site of a whole range of biomass crops to try to bring that biomass crop opportunity down into the done into the sector. And I think that's a, that's a really nice piece of work to be involved in for the next three years. The other projects that were funded for this 32 million are breeding technologies for willows, breeding technologies from Ascanthus, energy grasses, the short rotation coppice in there, short rotation forestry, um, crops like switchgrass, reedgrass, um, hemp. So there's a lot of other stuff. There's new harvesting technologies. Uh, planting technologies, cultivation, propagation. There's a lot of really nice stuff in there, um, and I'm just really, really glad that we are part of it. So bottom line, because I know I'm probably a minute or two over, um, the contribution of the agri-land sector is essential if we are indeed going to be decarbonizing society in a circular economy, not just from an energy point of view, but a bioresource. Those bioresources have to come from somewhere. Sustainable biomass, biomass crops, agri-residues, agri-wastes, we have a circular economy we can very much be part of. I've given some examples of some project work where I think we're, we're realizing some of this, but we're kind of at early days. Um, and then the, 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 the nutrient aspect and our environment, I think this is definitely where the circular economy can come in play. This is definitely where new technologies come in. I think we can kind of realize a really rosy, rosy future for what I've talked about, integrated with livestock agriculture. And let's move towards 2050. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Chris, and I am going to get you a pair of glasses. <laughs> um, 
it, we've got a heavy morning and I hope you're all staying with us. As you can tell, Chris is very passionate about his AD and his willows and, and, and rightly so, it has, has huge potential for Northern Ireland. But do stay with us. Um, we've got one more presentation and then the panel session. We've just so much to say since we haven't been talking to you so much over the past couple of years. So um, with no further ado, I'd like to introduce um, Stephen Morrison, who is our Head of Livestock Production Sciences and really looks after our Afby Hillsborough site. So Stephen, um, by trade, if you like, is a, a dairy young stock research scientist, but has been very integral to a lot of our plans and thinking and development of decision support tools for the industry um, over the years and uh, really bringing forward plans and ideas as well of how to harness all this data that we're going to be um, enjoying over the coming years. So Stephen, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, for the invite to present. Uh, a few quick thoughts, well, hopefully quick, because you'll be, you'll be wanting lunch shortly, but uh, on sort of sustainability, and by sustainability, it's greenhouse gases and beyond. So again, a quick overview. I'm going to look at greenhouse gases, what we can do now, some visions for the future, building on the previous speakers, not trying to overlap too much with the previous speakers, but also then look into sustainability, because it is much more than greenhouse gases. So we start to think about tackling greenhouse gases, um, there are many strategies we can do now that really can make deli deliver significant savings. And again, but there is going to be this major gap still to bridge. So AFPI um, had, had the, the honour of leading a number of consortiums across the UK to deliver some recent reports. You'll see a picture of them on the screen here. And one of the most recent reports we were able to show by the adoption of those current or nearly current technologies, we could deliver a 23% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. And that is, a, that is a significant reduction, but there's a big gap still to bridge. Also within that, we had to assume very ambitious uptake targets in the industry. So again, this really leads through to two big meanings or two big actions, really. One, even more important role for science than ever to help bridge that gap on the role for innovation, and also that real need for knowledge exchange and support to allow farmers to adapt to new ways of working. So as I've said, that the previous speakers have really highlighted a number of strategies, and I'm not going to touch on those. I'm going to try and highlight a couple of additional strategies that may help us reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. So the first one really here is our fundamental base of our livestock systems, and that's the genetics. That's the, 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 the inherent breeding that is in the animals themselves. And the golden thing genetic improvement is to breed those better animals for particular traits or economically derived indexes. And really, this is, not a, this is not going to be a quick fix. It's not going to happen overnight, but it's something we're strategically going to have to do. And Shani had mentioned that in her earlier talk. So this illustration sort of really emphasizes and shows actually something that Shani had mentioned, the fact that it's permanent and cumulative. So you'll see each of those building blocks that's coming through. If we valued that as genetic gain, valued at 1,000 pounds, or valued it at a percentage reduction in methane, that adds up over time. And because it's cumulative, it stays there. It's built in. So that 1,000 in year one, adds up to 165,000 in year 20. So that's the significance you've got when you take that longer term approach. So where are we now? We, well, with the, the pressure on and the target set for carbon reduction, methane reduction as well, we have to really start building in those methane and carbon reduction into our breeding traits going forward and our indexes. So how do we do that? And people mention genetics, they automatically get concerned about the complexity of it, but it's actually relatively simple uh, when you boil it back down to it. First thing we need to have is genetic variation. And if we look at the room here in front of me, we're all different. We're all different heights, hair colors, interests. That's genetic variation in built in there. And that's the same when we come to livestock. And again, Shanine mentioned the fact that in one of the ICBF projects, they've been able to show 20, 30% variation and reductions in methane emissions in livestock or offspring from different sires. So again, a very important thing to have there to start from. The second thing we must have is heritability. It must be something we can pass from generation to generation. So if you look at some of the traits we're, we're very familiar with, like milk yield, highly heritable. Somatic cell count, heritable. Fertility, relatively low heritable, but because we've focused on it and we've driven on it, we've had really improved in fertility in our dairy animals over the past 10, 15 years. Methane emissions in that early work that's happening globally, we're seeing heritabilities ranging from in and around 15 to 35%. So it is something we can target. It is something that's there to really aim for. The final part of the puzzle is how do we pick out those best animals? How do I pick out the smartest person in the room? It's very difficult to do. And what you need there is information, you need data. Traditionally, that's going back through the pedigrees, the ancestry, the progeny performance, and that still is an important part of the puzzle, but more and more genomic information is coming in there. So looking into the DNA, relating that DNA to those markers of efficiency or performance. 
So that, that's really a game changing what we can do with genetics. At the bottom, some, some work is sort of speculated or forecasted that if we sort of selectively breed for methane reduction or methane intensity, we can reduce uh, that, that emission by 24% by 2050. And with the new technologies that keep coming on stream in terms of genetic evolution and genetic developments, and then increasing the focus because of the importance being placed on greenhouse gases, I think that 24% can be increased further. So again, what steps do we need to take possibly in Northern Ireland to do that? Well, first things we have to do is really uh, go back to the principles where phenotype is king. It's a common term you'll hear in the genetics world. We need data. So if you look at that, when we're thinking about methane emissions, we need to be able to have lots of measurements of the animal's methane emissions to be able to relate back and identify those superior animals. And luckily enough, in Northern Ireland, we're very fortunate with an AFPI. We've got some of the leading facilities in terms of uh, respiratory chambers, but also have invested quite significantly in mobile equipment for monitoring emissions and planning to invest further. And again, we've strategically, with DERA, set up the Northern Ireland Farmed Animal Biobank, which really capturing all that data across the DERA family farms. So again, if we sort of look at that and what scale are we really talking about, again, there's a recent paper really indicated that if we had 100 farms, roughly 150 cows, measured that for two years, those methane emissions, plus all the other traits, we would be going down a long way down the road to be able to start to predict methane emissions and bring it into our breeding goals with reasonable security and pre precision. The second part there is really bringing in genomic selection, and this has been touched on a little bit earlier too. And what, what we do that is being able to precisely pick out those animals, even if we've got limited data, to really breed from those animals that are going to be more efficient and, and lower emissions. But again, what's important here is linking back to that phenotype as king. So ICBF and the South of Ireland have really progressed in this and, and brilliantly, brilliantly got over one million animals genotyped. But what they're finding so far to move in the genomic world is they need more and more of those phenotypes, more and more of those absolute methane measurements. And that's where the direction of travel is going, and that's where we need to be going also. But if we move further again, and this is why the world keeps changing, we've got multiomics, which is really into the next generation of, of breeding. And that's really bringing in even more information. That's looking at what genes are upregulated, downregulated, what biological pathways are, are happening, what's actually the resultant proteins being produced in the animal. That gives you that absolute precision. And AFPI's leading um, geneticist, and uh, Dr. Masood Sharali, really believes this is the technology that's really going to accelerate us further, increase that accuracy. And that's even beyond methane. It's going to bring us into disease resilience, uh, disease susceptibility, and a wide range of traits that are going to be critical for sustainability as a whole. And linking back into David in his, his previous talk, we can't forget forage breeding. And David did touch on this. Again, obviously, AFPI's at forage breeding programs. And, as they're going forward, we'll be focusing more into those sustainability traits, such as this nutrient efficiency, such as the rooting depth to be able to cope with climate change, such as digestibility to, to inherently reduce the methane emissions from that forage in the animal's diet. But who knows, maybe in the future, we'll actually inbreed some of those methane inhibitor properties into the plants themselves. So again, it is an exciting time for breeding, both at the animal level and at the plant level. Some, another sort of novel strategy that some may be familiar with and others maybe not, is we can start to look at how we can capture methane itself. So the picture on the, on the screen here is a wearable technology, maybe difficult at the back to see, but this is a technology which captures the methane, oxidizes that methane, turns it into CO2 and water vapor. It also, within the prototype devices, it has the ability to then monitor that reduction in methane and then feed into carbon credit type markets going forward. This is where the innovators are really starting to think differently on what can be possible. In a recent conference in Florida there in the summertime or late summer, they were able to show um, in the prototypes 25 to 50 percent reductions in methane emissions from that type of technology. We're very familiar with sc air scrubbing technologies or grass scrubbing technologies in our monogastric sectors, in our pig and poultry. That's an example of ammonium scrubber there. But that type of technology is starting to feed its way through into the, into the ruminant world with plans afoot to start looking at methane capture in the air in animal housing. And again, capture, linking that through to what Chris was talking about, capturing it from the slurries and manures also. So again, building into that circularity discussion. But what's probably clear, uh, hopefully clear from the, both the talks before me and my, my own talk is, is there's no silver bullet. There's not something that's just going to solve it overnight. It's going to be a combined approach. It's going to be essential and using that toolbox that Elizabeth mentioned. There's going to be a lot of considerations within this. You know, the cost, obviously, we're a relatively low margin industry. There's major pressure on the consumer in terms of price of food. Um, so where's that money going to come from to pay for these innovations if the particular they're not the win-win ones? Because some of them may not always be win-win. Again, we also look into things like time, the time pressure to act, 
and try and halt that global warm is, is greater than ever. And that they'll know the local and national and international targets that are being set, so we have to act quickly. So what are those techniques and strategies that we want to deliver it's at pace? We have to be very cognizant of potential trade-offs. So we must be assured that we don't target, say, reduce methane emissions, but then inadvertently increase ammonia emissions or impact on animal welfare. So that's why we have to think holistically when it comes to the options in front of us. And again, don't forget the consumer and the consumer acceptance. There already is, are thoughts about methane inhibitors. Is it something that's going to be acceptable at the consumer level? And again, that even brings in the consumer education and awareness and how that feeds through. And finally, probably a theme that will run through the remaining slides is the ability to both monitor, report, and verify what or where we are already, our baselines, and what we're actually changing. To be able to report on it, to quantify it, is going to be absolutely essential in this world going forward. So that's probably part A of the talk, which is largely about the greenhouse gas emissions. Now I'm moving more onto the, the wider thought of sustainability because we must not lose sight that sustainability is much, much more than greenhouse gases. So traditionally, and I haven't broke tradition here, everyone always puts up a definition of sustainability. And again, you can see it here, and it is going back to 1987, and it still holds as a very good definition of sustainability. I've focused on a few of the key words, and it's really balance of economic growth, environmental care, and social well-being. So those three pillars. And that's often sort of broken down or simplified down to the three P's of sustainability, which is illustrated here in the people, the planet, and the profit. And having that all together really gets us into the discussion about what is our safe operating space for livestock systems. So if I sort of, oh, you can just about see a bit of the title here, but what I'm trying to say is sustainability is not just a nice word to say. It's an easy word to throw out there. But it is a growing aspect of both our business models and our consumer expectation. And again, I'll not go through all the slides because they're probably quite difficult to see, but um, what we can really see is, yes, the price of our food and the quality of our food is still a high, high priority in the consumer and will be uh, under current sort of climate conditions. But there's growing interest and growing concern around animal health and welfare, the environmental footprint of our farming systems, the, wealth and, uh, the welfare and the ethics of the production in terms of the, the, the producers and the operators in the in supply chain. That's all growing in interest in the consumer. If you move across into the global side of things, there's a lot more value being put on biodiversity and natural capita. And, and discussions actually in this model on the right-hand side of the global model that a small decline in biodiversity is worth trillions of dollars globally. So again, it's becoming more and more important, more and more important at our CEO level in the big businesses, and actually a core foundation, a part of our green growth strategy in Northern Ireland. But throughout all this, relating back to the previous slide, we must be able to measure, report, and verify any claims that we're putting forward in terms of sustainability. And that's a challenge, The sustainability is so broad. And that's partly why AFB Queen's in partnership with a number of industry partners, and, and there's a number of them in the room today, um, are leading on a project with, through the Agri-Food Quest Competency Centre, co-funded by InvestNI, called Food Futures. And the illustration in the top right tries to sum it up a little bit, but it's really about trying to bring together that data as a first stage pat platform to capture and credit sustainability of our farming systems. It's really um, sustainability with scientifically robust underpinnings is the, is the key feature to this. The, the scientists really trawled through huge amounts of literature to pull out the key metrics, the key indicators, consulted widely with the industry teams to pull together what, what is essential for Northern Ireland going forward. It's built to be adaptable as the changing sort of commercial market changes, but also the policy agenda changes. And we're all aware of all the different policy sort of interventions, drivers that both locally and globally. So that's, that's the sort of the, the setup behind the scenes when it comes to future, for futures. What it looks like in, in reality really is one of these dashboards um, where all the information is coming in. This is the environmental dashboard. We've also got economic and social dashboards built in. So here we can really see an example where a farmer's got those metrics boiled down to an environmental score, but also the ability to then delve into that and look at what's my biodiversity assessment, what's my carbon footprint, my ammonia, my slurry management, uh, but also they look at that change over time, but also their peers to see where, where, where they can maybe make a difference. One of the key features that's been really positively received in the, in the sort of pilot development of Food Futures is the fact that each of the farmers gets tailored recommendations back, and it's not this one-size-fits-all approach. So when they're a particular report, they'll get particular direction of how they can improve on each of those indicators, and that's proved incredibly popular. And the proof is probably in the pudding when you look through to this. So the very bottom right, every single farmer on the Food Futures group reported significant increases in what actually sustainability is in a farming system, what it actually means, uh, because it is a complex word. 
On top of that, almost all the producers said they are preparing to make significant changes to their systems on the back of what Food Futures have been able to show them. And then in the pie chart here, it really shows you what they've actually done already. So there have been significant changes in terms of 11% of the farmers now caught carbon auditing, investing in renewable energies, planting trees, etc. And that they've credited down to being able to see that and visualize that in their food futures systems and the importance of it in their wider sustainability. Using, using food futures just as an example here, what is 100% clear for sustainability platforms of any type is successful partnership across all stakeholders in that supply chain and that true collaboration. Um, so again, we have a wide range of partners from scientists, farming organizations, processors, feed companies, several government departments, and the Farm Quality Assurance Scheme, all linked into Food Futures and the development and the implementation of it. And again, indeed, we're working through a slightly larger pilot, over 150 farms with the Farm Quality Insurance guys currently. The second sort of fundamental really comes out there is this underpinning need for a data sharing culture and trust. Uh, what's our data being used for? And clearly being aware of what's being used for and how it's been shared. That's essential. And that probably leads me through to sort of a future vision when it comes to sustainability. And again, Northern Ireland can be quite good at sharing data. This is just one example, and there are lots of examples out there. Obviously, AFB's developed the bovine information system. And this is just an example how we've got information coming from, I think it's eight or less nine abattoirs, information coming from the government APHIS system, information now starting to flow in from the livestock markets, and information coming from farmers. And that's all been shared and brought through into platforms with lots of um, farmer decision tools developed in the back of it, but also the research capabilities built into that as well. But if I sort of think further forward and widen the vision beyond that, what could it look like? So again, in here, this is just an example of what it could look like in Northern Ireland, where we've got a really, really strong core pillar there in the Deer's Information Hub with lots of incredibly valuable information in there on animals, land, soil nutrient health, uh, above ground biomass coming forward. Our stakeholder data flows in terms of animal health, productivity, genetics coming forward, farm quality assurance, leading into all the decision support tools that can be developed in the back, and then finally leading into that of ultimate platform of sustainability in terms of food futures or similar. So again, this is really showing where we can improve our management, how we can then inform our marketing, how we can improve our environmental footprint, and then finally on the bottom, enhance our overall sustainability. So it's all about data flow, data share. Key principles on the right, and again, interest of time, I'll not be able to go through every one of them, but I'll pick out a few, is we have to use what we have. And we're very fortunate in Northern Ireland to have a lot of data, a lot of information there. So let's use it. Let's use it for, for, for gain and benefit for all. Information must be robust. And that's a real strong strength of having the science community involved in that. We can't put rubbish data in or you will get rubbish data out. <coughs> Collect it once, use it efficiently. Don't ask the same thing three times. For two things, it, it's absolutely inefficient. And you may not always get the same answer back three times. So make sure you ask it once and you use one version of, of the truth. Transparency, permission control, all critically important. And value share, which is maybe not often talked about. If that extra information is flowing through and derives extra value in the, in, the, in the supply chain in some shape or form, make sure that value is shared back through the supply chain. And then finally, that, that underwriting principle of being able to monitor, report, and verify is essential, core throughout. So that's really an example of how we can quantify sustainability. And that links through to the ability to be able to model it, which again, is it, pretty complex. So again, we look at the current situation when it comes to modeling, and um, we have a number, and AFP's developed some of the world-leading sort of component models that are out there on things like carbon LCAs at tier three, or greenhouse gas ammonia inventories, where a lot of our equations are feeding into those national inventories. Our phosphorus and nitrogen balances, economic models, biodiversity models, there's a lot of models, and there will be continually need to constantly improve and refine those models as new science develops, new understanding comes forward, our new abilities to monitor and measure things just develop, allows that to happen. There's limited, and it may be slightly controversial for some scientists, and there's limited multi-dimensional models where we're trying to bring some of those elements together. But we are, probably would be the current focus of a lot of effort. Examples could be linking greenhouse gases, the economics, linking greenhouse gases, the behavioral change or animal health, how it all comes together in sort of multiple component models, if you want to call it that. An example also, DEER are currently have a PhD and they're looking at the safe operating space of ecosystems and how they develop over time and where the pinch points are in those systems. So again, that's a multi-component model. But if you sort of look further and leads me into the next slide, as you can probably guess, um, the direction of travel when it comes to sustainability modeling is going much more holistic. It's going bigger and broader, which as you can probably guess, adds even more complexity. So again, our three pillars in the top right, 
we've started thinking holistic modeling. If we can bring those three pillars together, together we really get the ability to really look at the new insights and particularly those trade-offs. If we affect something, what happens elsewhere? And that's the understanding we need to be able to get to. But as, I, as I've mentioned, the degree of complexity is now immense and will require new ways of being able to analyze data, bringing in new expertise into the agri-food sector and industries. And what I'm talking here is really AI, machine learning, and particularly things like deep learning. And again, I'm going to show a relatively simple um, neural network. I'm not going to explain it, so don't worry. Um, but what, this is a, a simple neural network based on the Food Futures data collections to date. And what it really shows is how all the different metrics and indicators of sustainability interlink and how the relationships are formed and the strength of those relationships. And the reason that was done was able to look at, well, where's the pinch points? Where's the risk factors? What happens if we impact here? What's going to happen over there? So that's the level of complexity we're getting to, and that's why new ways of analysis are going to come to the front. And all that feeding back down to the ability to really look at where we are when it comes to our safe operating space as a farming system. And you'll be glad to know I'm on the summary. Um, so one or two summary slides. So both in my presentation and the previous speakers before me, we have got mitigation strategies now for greenhouse gases that we can really deploy and get out there and make a significant impact. The importance of science is greater than ever to be able to bridge the gap of what's possible now and where we have to get to, and also the importance of uh, knowledge exchange and farmer support in bridging that gap. We must not focus purely on greenhouse gas emissions, but because it is a multi-component type system, and we must think broader and holistically, including all actors in the supply chain. We sort of measuring, reporting, and verification. Hopefully, I've, I've drilled that one enough. Um, it's going to be a core requirement throughout if we're going to move forward in the right direction and know how far we have moved forward. And again, when it comes to MRV modeling and forecasting, unlocking these will only be possible through supply chain data and making that shared and accessible. That will open up the new business models and will also feed into the growing consumer demand for sustainability and actually understanding what sustainability is. Collaboration and working together in partnership is essential, um, and that feeds through all the talks actually this morning. And our data integration and analytics, such as an example in Food Futures, offers that real opportunity to increase sustainability of our agri-food systems. And the very last comment is really, through our connectiveness, our scientific community, our knowledge exchange infrastructure, and the data richness that's there and expanding further, I definitely believe Northern Ireland has the potential to be world leading when it comes to sustainable agri-food production. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. And could I ask our panel members, we're going to take a 15 minutes, and I know it's lunchtime, I know it's nearly tw it is 12 o'clock, but we're going to take 15 minutes here because I think there's been a, a lot of rich information there this morning, and I know there's a number of questions here have come in, which is wonderful on Slido. So if I could invite our speakers back to the, uh, to the top table or top stage here, please. And then also Sharon Hughes, um, who's Professor of Animal Science and Microbiology at Queen's, as well as the Director of Research within the School of Biological Sciences, Queen's. Rosemary Agnew, who is the Director of Agricultural Policy Division, and William Irvine, uh, Deputy President of the Ulster Farmers Union. If we could ask our panel members and our speakers to come to the front, please. And folks, for, for you in the audience, um, I'm looking at questions all over my screen here. Um, there are questions logged there. If you want to vote on them, that will help me make sure I present the right question to the panel. And um, keep typing in your questions, and I'll keep trying to bring them across into the, uh, the list. So to get us going, um, folks, I'm going to go straight to Sharon, because I said earlier, th th don't touch the mics, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we'll get instructions, I'm sure. Um, so we have a real richness in Ireland when it comes to expertise in rumen microbiome and methane emissions, and Sharon is one of those players. So Sharon, there's a question here for you, if that's okay. Um, how do we know about the downstream effects of these additives on, for example, carcass composition and excreta and any unintended consequences? Maybe just expand that area of work with them. It should work. Is it working? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All scientists want to play and see how it works, I guess. Um, so when we do our experiments uh, between AFB and Queen's on feed additives, we try and look at the, um, the effects right through to slaughter, so to the carcass quality. We look at the, the quality of the 
meat itself, whether we've affected things like the health attributes of the milk, and also right down to um, the taste. So using some of the taste panel work in AFB as well, so that it's a, it's a really holistic view. And we also look at the ammonia component as well, because like uh, Stephen was saying, you can't just look at additives on their own. You have to look at all of the other trade-offs, the consequences, um, right through to the consumer acceptance of, of those additives as well. Thank you, Sharon. So there's a real holistic program of work involved in all of this. It's like any additive going into the feed system with approvals. Rosemary, I'm going to come to you next. I hope this is a fair enough question. <laughs> um, and and, and I, know, I know you're not a supermarket, but I think it's the same kind of concept. So the question is, when supermarkets, um, and even maybe policy, demand low carbon produce and production, will this encourage intensive farming systems? And where does this leave the more extensive farming systems? Hopefully all of you can hear me. Um, I think in a simple answer to your question, all farming systems have a role as we move forward. We've heard a lot today, um, and I'll pick up on Katrina's three words around science, innovation, and collaboration. We all must use the best evidence for our farming systems, be they extensive or intensive, to lower carbon emissions, improve biodiversity, deliver ecosystem services, that environmental sustainability. But we must do that in a way that we also have efficient farms where we increase productivity, the farms are more resilient, which are really the outcomes that we're seeking to drive from the future agricultural policy that's being developed within um, the department and across Northern Ireland with our key stakeholders. I think the last outcome um, that I want to mention is a more effective functioning supply chain, and that's where the supermarkets come in, so that holistically, we can deliver increased productivity on all farms, irrespective of the type of the farming system, um, and deliver those environmental sustainability credentials and the resilience that's required right throughout the supply chain. William, would you like to comment on that as well, please? Yeah, yes, a sustainable farming and the supply of food is, is under a bit of pressure at the moment. And Society, you know, there's a demand for uh, food, there's a demand for energy production, and there's a demand from the environment. And there's a balance to be got here in all of this. And agriculture is fundamental, you know, at, at farm level, agriculture is the fundamental base for all of this to happen. A, it, it will take a wide variety of farms, and that's, that's good. But it has to be sustainable from the environment point of view. But I, I, as a person here representing farmers, sustainable to a lot of our guys means a good livelihood for our industry and a viable enough business to pass on to the next generation. And you know, there's a lot of new thoughts here today, and there's a, uh, you know there's a there's a journey for all agriculture in this. We feel a bit vulnerable here. The, 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 there's a lot being asked and a lot of quick change, and quick change is challenging. It is, it yeah. is, and, and that's certainly a topic maybe for another conference, is that whole social science is how we actually bring this in, in an achievable way, um, because we have a very strong industry out there, which is important. Um, there is, a, I'm gonna go back to you, Rosemary, on another, sorry. Not picking on you. <laughs> uh, there's a couple of questions come in here have said, you know, all these technologies, all these advances, how do we make sure the inventory recognises them? Thanks, Elizabeth. I think that is the challenge. And I think that's specifically where there is a very clear role for science to help to demonstrate that robust evidence that these new technologies and innovations actually deliver the robust results that we think they may do. Um, because we can all lift a newspaper day and daily and see some new innovation, but we haven't the robust science behind it. So I would clearly throw that maybe back at yourself, Elizabeth, and say there's a clear role for AFPI um, and any other scientist in the room to try and ensure that the inventory accounts and can take account of all of the new innovations that are coming on stream. 
because we have significant targets to meet as an agri-food industry and we will need all of these innovations in terms of co contributions to the inventory. Yeah. And we have actually, just for, for folk information, we have been very successful working with um, our colleagues in DERA and the infantry committees to actually build portfolios of science that have been able to influence what the infantry accepts and etc. And, and we have a good pathway there established for that. So I would have a confidence that we now know how and we know what's needed and we have a good working relationship um, between the science community, uh, policy colleagues and the infantry committees. So it's one that needs work as in work to get the portfolios together, but the pathway and the collaboration is good. Um, on cre carbon credits, so you're, you're keeping me very busy here. This is fantastic. The amount of questions coming in is fantastic. Um, carbon credits. I think I'm going to go to you here, Chris, first, OK, and, and maybe then William. How do we ensure that carbon credits from energy generated through agriculture waste are returned back to agriculture when carbon budgets are being built? Yeah. Um, yeah, I was really worried you were going to come to me with that one, actually, <laughs> um, when I saw it pop in, because a lot of people who know me out there will know that I keep asking that exact question as well. I think it's vital that if agriculture starts to contribute to the energy sector, and let's face it, it's a, it's a, it's a legitimate market. We have, we have a demand for energy. I think, I think you know, bioenergy, as we hopefully it was clear in my, in my talk, has a really important role to play to decarbonize society towards 2050. But Agriculture has to be recognized for delivering that, both in terms of the actual value of the product, but also from the carbon. And I, I'm s sorry, but I don't know the actual answer to the hug the carbon credit part. I know there's one or two people in the audience who will know better, but until carbon actually has a legitimate value and people are actually being paid for it, I think it's very hard to answer that. And I'm, I'm sorry, I can't be more clear. Wait, William, maybe you have a comment? Yeah, a, a couple of comments. A Agriculture, I think, is where to say fields that we have not got a fair hearing in, in that when, when we do our carbon audits, there's no allowance made for what's stored in, in our land, in our hedgerows, in, in our trees. So we're, we're sort of feeling we're, we're starting from the wrong place, or not, not a fair place. Uh, the other point I would make is uh, across in GBEs, particularly in Scotland, there's a trend towards large cash rich companies buying chunks of land to offset their carbon. And they're doing, they're, they're making no behavioral change within their own business whatsoever. And I think that's a complete con and a cop out. Thank you, William. We'll, we'll move on to a different subject here. There's lots of AD questions, Chris. But <laughs> if, if we don't get them answered today, we'll, we'll capture these questions and, and put um, comments on them because we do plan to release the conference as a whole come Friday. Um, so Stephen, question for yourself. Um, food futures, will it integrate soil health nutrient scheme going forward? Yes, a good question. So uh, the, the initial sort of prototype design of it, it would be set up to be able to bring that data in. Um, so we are already working with some of the previous uh, work that was done before the health scheme, some of the catchment project work, to see if we can bring that in as sort of a, a test bed and um, to make sure it does be compatible going forward. Thank you. David, over to yourself. Um, da, da, da. Has anyone explored silvopastoral with, with multi-species um, swords in the dairy production system? And is this something that we should explore? Not to my knowledge, but I think it's one that we have planned to explore in, uh, in, uh, in a future study um, with the department. But it's, it's a vital one that has to be done because the dairy is still probably the, the, the biggest generating sector within agriculture. So it, we must look at that. Thank you, David. Um, Sharon, I'm going to come back to yourself on, uh, let me see, there was one here. <laughs> How, and this is, we're getting very technical again here, Sharon. Um, introducing O2 oxygen to the rumen, uh, do, how does that affect the efficiency of the anaerobic digestion process? Surely there's a tension there. Yeah, that, that's a good question. I like it when it's technical. I can do technical. <laughs> that's fine. Um, so some of the data that Sinead was showing on the halides, we're also testing them at the minute in, in Hillsborough. Some of, some of the early, and I say this is a caveat, early information is that you do get a, 
a production value as well from those additives, which of course is, is, is huge. We have to repeat it again and again to make sure that it's, um, um, it's, it's correct. But it would seem to me that if, that if you are getting a production value, what you're doing is switching the fermentation. So you're switching the fermentation towards the valuable fat, uh, volatile fatty acids, if you, if you like, that give the animal energy. So that little bit of oxygen is perhaps giving that push in the right direction. Okay, thank you. So it's, it's possible. It's possible, it yeah. is, yeah. Really conscious of time here, and there's a really good question for, for each of you. Okay, I'll say the question first, and then you can think, <laughs> I'll pick on one of you to, to go for it first. Pulling all the strands of this morning together, what vision do you have for ruminant agriculture in 2050? So if, if you're a farmer out there in the audience, you, do, William, you just said it's, it's, it's scary. W what's out there in the amount of change that's coming down the track? I see a, personally, I see a lot of hope and opportunity in all of that, but the, the level of mindset change is significant. But if you're, if you're sitting out there, what, what can you tell a farmer out there this morning of uh, what you see as farming in 2050? Do you mean many well? <laughs> William, we'll go to you first. Yep, uh, happy, happy to take that one. I, I am very optimistic for agriculture going forward. A, Wider society in recent years, I think, sort of tried us and found us wanting on, on the whole climate change piece. But, but as, as minds focus on actually what the problems are and what the solutions may be, it, it's being proven out as, to what we have always said, we are part of the solution here. A, I suspect there's nobody in this room hasn't started their day with a breakfast of some sort. People are not going to stop eating. People need food. And we have the ability to food. We we are a, an industry that has continually changed and adapted, and th there's more of that coming at us. But we are up for that, and we will be there. Thank you, William. David. Maybe as one of the slightly older members of the panel, um, <laughs> over the years, um, growing up in, in 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 agricultural communities and so on, farming has always been at a crossroads. But farming's still here. And I think it's one thing we were talking with William last night was, you know, at, at the heart of farming, when you, when you get by all of the, 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 the technical, the scientific, the, 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 the future plans, challenges, targets, and all of that, there's a family farm structure uh, that gets passed on and inherited and so on. And that's the fabric. <coughs> That's the fabric I think that'll hold the industry, it has held the industry together, it'll continue to hold the industry together. And there's enough innovators out there, and there's enough adopters out there, and there's enough support from the industry in this room, you know, to help farmers, I think, get through the challenges. So I think that's, the, the family farm structure for me is the, is, 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 is the humus in the soil. That's what'll hold it together and the support industry will guide farmers through. You just have to give us, the, res the research community, a wee bit of time. There's been an awful lot of um, early findings reported, and I was, I was guilty of that in, in, in my talk, but I think we have to have a little bit of time, and we do have time, to put the building blocks of how we tackle things like uh, carbon targets and all of those associated targets that are, that are coming ar around that. Um, we do need time to put the building blocks together correctly in a, a holistic way mm -hmm. to give a proper blueprint, if you like, to the, to the farming sector. Thank Sorry, you. that's a long answer. Sharon? Sure. <laughs> um, yes, well, there's no doubt, you know, it, the sector is a, a com complex sector to be in um, at the minute. But, you know, I'm very optimistic and I think... Um, like has been said before me, we're on a journey. We're on a journey and we are here to support the industry. And that journey will be, um, it may be right at the beginning, we have some data, but as we go on, it's gonna be data that's really fundamental to that journey. And the robustness of the things that we can put in place for, for the sector, 
But I think we just, we have to keep on going and we have to support the sector and make sure that they feel that they are supported in this journey going forward as well. So I'm, I'm hugely optimistic. The innovations even in the last 10 years have been really transformative. Thank you, Sharon. Um, any quick last on Chris? Then. Not having any luck with technology. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and I suppose uh, where, where I'm kind of imagining things in the future is, with, is and I've talked about it, you know, th this, this whole bioeconomy, by 2050, we cannot be relying on our carbon resources to come from the North Sea or wherever that might be. It has to come from the land. It has to come from the agri-land sector. It has to come from ourselves. Um, so what I would envisage is, just as I was trying to describe, you know, we, we do have a fledgling bioeconomy in Ireland. Um, there's more going on in the south than there is in the north, I would argue. But um, in Europe, it is, it is happening, it is developing. There are, there are materials, there are pharmaceuticals, there are bioactives, there are uh, replacement products for all sorts of stuff that we're used to and we see all around us today, which are coming from the land. So I suppose if I was slightly sort of naive and idealistic, I would say that the, we would see farming in the future as being a lot more integrated with a number of different crops, different biomass crops, different energy crops, different materials. Yes, agriculture, livestock, very much a part, but you just take a walk around Hillsborough now and you see you know, four or five hectares of biomass crops that are, that are integrated along with the livestock agriculture, that are protecting water quality, sequestering carbon, fueling the site. You know, we, we, we don't, the oil boiler doesn't come on when, the, when we need it now, you know. And when, when oil's 10, 12 pence a kilowatt hour, that's a lovely thing to see. Zero carbon. So I would see an awful lot more than that, but of course you'd expect me to say that. And not only collaboration within, you know, the land sectors, but collaboration with transport sector and energy sector. I see a lot of collaboration with other sectors um, in, in the future as well. Yes. Rosemary? Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, back to, I think, what I said in response to the first question you asked me. Um, Mr. Putz last year set out his vision for the agriculture industry and the farming sector. Um, and it was in, about ensuring that the economic viability of agriculture is underpinned by a sharp focus predominantly on increased productivity, um, which is about using more efficient, more efficient use of those resources on the farm, not increased production, around environmental improvement, and that means decoupling agriculture from the negative environmental consequences, and building and investing on the environmental capital on the farms, and creating the conditions to make that an economic enterprise on the farm and a profit center, and that's in the vision that was published. But alongside that, we need to build increased resilience to enable farms to bounce forward and bounce back from the many shocks, and we've mentioned a number of those today. And then finally, we need to do all of that within an integrated functioning supply chain. And I think the final comment I would want to make, you know, I've been very encouraged by all of the research tools that have been presented today, because farming will need to change to meet the challenges, and we need the tools, the policy levers, the support schemes, the knowledge to help that behavior change and I think it's been very encouraging by what we've heard today. Yeah. And, and you know, we have changed behaviours. We talked about threshing the other night <laughs> in 2012. We've come a long way from that, the post-war era. Farming has adapted and changed as it has needed to do over the years. Stephen, you've got the last word. Yeah, well, that's great. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll basically reinforce what all the other speakers have said. I fully agree that I'm very optimistic about the future. Um, I was going to put one or two things on that. I think, as Sharon says, having the data and being able to quantify and verify where we are in 2050 is going to be essential. Um, within that is putting maybe more value onto the wider range of ecosystem services farming delivers. It's not just pure food. There's, there's flood prevention. There's the, the, the countryside we all appreciate. It all needs to be valued and, and brought forward. So that ability to capture that and present that's going to be essential. And again, that'll bring in extra revenue streams going forward. So very positive, and uh, I think we're all on the same page, hopefully. Thank you very much to you all as panel members. I know we, we cut a little bit short, but I do realise lunch is waiting for us. Um, thank you very much, and thank you for your attention, everybody. Hal back to Sarah.
Wow, what a, a fabulous first session, absolutely rich in content. Um, and for a non-technical person, I find it incredibly interesting. Thanks again to all of our speakers and to the additional panel members. Uh, lunch is served now, everybody. We will be uh, starting back at 2 p.m. But lunch is served at the back of the room. You can uh, bring your